it's always good to see you from all different parts of uh, not just India or America, but throughout the world and others who listen to our classes uh, by the videos that we release later on. Uh, today's lesson, uh, as we welcome you, is Adam and Eve, their sin and its consequences. Lesson number three in our advanced course, uh, which we are numbering uh, 201. And what we want to deal with is uh, the subject matter of sin uh, and its consequences. Uh, the subject of sin fills the pages of God's Word. Trying to understand what it is, how to deal with it, the consequences of it, uh, both in this life and in eternity. And so today, beyond what just we had in the textbook, uh, we're going to be talking about some of uh, the consequences of sin. Here we have in Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27, the statement that God made in his decision. Uh, and when we say his, we're talking about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in their decision to create mankind. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish, or fill the earth. And subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Thus is our account as related through Moses, uh, of the creation of man and woman. As we look at this statement, God wanted to create man in his own image. The rest of creation, the fowls of the air, the creeping things on the earth, that which swam in the sea, is not stated to be made in the image of God, but they were created for a certain purpose and to serve a certain purpose upon this earth. But mankind uh, was made in the image of God, and we're told that he made man in his own image and part of man or mankind was the creation of both male and female. And God blessed them. He encouraged them to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And just like God has dominion over all of his creation, the heavens and the earth, he gave the earth to man at, to have dominion over. And we're told in the end of the first chapter uh, that God looked upon all that he had created, and it was very good. It was a creation free of sin and its consequences, free of much of what we see today. It literally was a paradise uh, which we have continued to strive to regain, but that's not in the hands of man, but that's in the hands of God. Paradise will never be regained in this world, 
And we'll talk about that as we go on into future lessons. But we need to understand that sin has consequences. The world was very good. And as we continue on, uh, in order to understand the consequences, we have to understand better how God created man and woman in the beginning. Uh, we want to talk about the relationship of man and woman, husband and wife, as we see it in the scriptures. We're told in Genesis 2, verse 18, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And so as we look in the scriptures, we see that man was created first, and then there was a help that was created from him, and we know that to be the woman, for she was taken from the man. But as we talk about sin and consequences, we want to talk about the word meat that we see here in the scriptures. A lot of times when people are reading from uh, Genesis, the second chapter, and they're talking about woman, uh, they say that she is a help me, and they use both words uh, to as if they're one, and it's not exactly the case. First of all, there was uh, a help, a counter uh, part, someone to be with him. It was not good that he should be alone. He needed someone to help in the issues of life. And so God created this help, this uh, woman for the man. But emphasis should uh, be placed at this point on the word meet. The woman was a counterpart. She was equal to the task that God had given the man. She was to help him in all the situations and circumstances of life and to be blessed as the man, as humans uh, replenished or filled the earth. And so in the beginning, we do not see any great difference made between the man and the woman. Both were made in the image of God. There was the relationship God gave of the husband and the wife. God created them, brought them together, and we're told in the scriptures what God hath joined together, let not man put us under. And so as we continue, uh, we see that the woman and the man were to work together as one in a relationship before God. And so they were more or less on equal terms. She was supposed to be his help, which was meet, a counterpart equal to the task. Uh, we do not deny that woman and man were in the beginning created equal in all aspects. But as we look at the subject of sin and its consequences, we begin to understand why some things change and why we see certain teachings in the scriptures. When God created man and then he created woman, he brought them into a relationship as husband and wife. And so we see this pyramid, this triangle, this trinity that reflects the relationship of marriage to God. The uh, God of the universe created man and he created woman, and the man and the woman have a relationship with God 
individually, but they also have a relationship with one another as a family. And as the man and the woman leave their father and mother in the course of time, those two would become one. And if you look in this pyramid that we have, as they come closer and closer and closer to one another, they're also coming closer to God. And so this was a godly relationship between the man and his wife and God in the beginning. And so this constitutes the perfect relationship that God envisioned for mankind and himself, that this relationship uh, would go forth and fill the earth. And the plan ultimately was that man and woman would be in these unique relationships. And from that, of course, would come the family and the children until such time as they left home and became independent themselves. When they left, and they would cleave or be joined to their husband or their wife. And so as we <clears throat> look at the first and the second chapter of Genesis and the completion of the creation and the bringing together of the man and the woman, we have a fellowship, we have a relationship between God's earthly creation, man and woman, and himself. Uh, and they are uh, to coexist, to work together. And the purpose given the man was to tend the garden. God planted the garden. And in the garden, everything uh, was given to them for food. Uh, the King James says it shall be for meat, but it's not talking necessarily about flesh, but it's talking about food. And so we have everything as it ought to be uh, with one uh, commandment given to them. Genesis 2, 16, 17. The Lord God commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden, thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So far as we can tell, uh, there were very few direct commandments. God put a blessing upon the man and woman, told them to be fruitful, multiply, Feel the earth, subdue it, have dominion over all of those things. They were made stewards of God's creation. And the only thing that they were told specifically that they could not do was to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This was put there. Uh, as a test of their faithfulness. If they chose to be faithful to God, they would leave the tree alone. But if they chose not to be faithful to God, if they no longer wanted that relationship with God, at any time they were free to eat of that tree of which God said, when you do, you shall surely die. Now, people say, well, God said that they would surely die when they ate of the tree. Well, God didn't say they would die that day, but he did say that they would surely die. And so one of the consequences that we see in the commands of God uh, was not to eat of this tree uh, because there would be consequences if they did. 
And the extreme end of those consequences uh, would be death, physical death, something as of yet Adam and Eve knew nothing about other than the warning that such was possible if they failed to be faithful to God and stay away from the tree as far as eating the fruit thereof. As we continue into Genesis and the first part of Scripture, in Genesis 3, uh, we find an introduction uh, to the serpent who uh, was, in essence, the devil, who was tempting and testing God's creation. And we'll uh, perhaps in later lessons spend more time on the devil. But we want to understand that we're told that the serpent was more subtle than any of the beasts of the field which the Lord God had made. And so the serpent chose the woman, and he came to the woman and said, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So what he's questioning ultimately is, didn't God say that you could eat of all the trees? And the woman's reply to the serpent was, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, which is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now there has been a point made in this, that Eve seems to add to what God said. Now, how that came to be, uh, we're not certain. We have a statement that God told the man not to eat of the fruit of the tree. He did not, in the early part of the second chapter, tell him he could not touch it. After all, he was there to tend the garden, the fruit of the trees. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, whatever that may have been, belonged to God. God said, do not eat thereof. Now, Eve said that God had also said, neither shall you touch it. We don't have a record of that or where she got that. Some have said that perhaps God did tell them not to touch it. But others seem to believe that it was the man who was there when God told him not to eat thereof. And so it seems that perhaps it was Adam's idea that to tell the woman not to even touch it. If you don't touch it, then you can't eat it. And so he perhaps added to God's commands. Then the serpent begins to question the things of God, and he begins to lie to her and to deceive her. When he says to the woman, you shall not, surely die. Now that's a direct contradiction to the things of God. And here's where sin comes. God tells us the things that are best for us and how life can be best for us. And the devil comes along tempting, saying, no, God just wants to keep something good away from you, and he wants to keep it for himself. And so the serpent says, you shall not surely die. But on the other hand, he says, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as God's knowing good and evil. There's the, the lie mixed with just enough truth 
to make one question what God has said. The devil says, you shall not surely die. You shall not surely die. But that's not what God said. He gives the lie, but then he says, God knows that in the day you eat thereof, ye will be like gods. You shall be as God. Of course, then he throws in just a little bit of truth, knowing good and evil. He made it sound like they could be just like their creator if they just ate of the tree. That it wasn't really death that God was afraid of or warning them of, but he was afraid to let them be like him. That's the lie. Just enough truth mixed with a lot of lies. And then we saw, or then we see that the woman saw that the tree was good for food. And it was pleasant to the eyes. And she says it was desired, or it says that it was desired to make one wise uh, in knowing the difference between good and evil. And so we're told that she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And so the devil tempts her. He lies to her, twisting truth, mixing truth, a little truth with a lot of lie. The woman is deceived, and then she, after eating it, presents it to her husband, who is left with a dilemma whether to eat the fruit and be like his wife or to listen to what God has said. Sadly, Adam chose the latter, and he chose to be like his wife. And if she was going to come under the condemnation of God, he chose to be with her in that. So thus we have the sin. We have the sin of deception to Mother Eve, the devil tempting her, testing her, beguiling her, with a little uh, bit of truth and a whole lot of lies. And she believes what he says more than what God and her husband has said. And she eats thereof. And she presents it to her husband. Uh, it's sort of a, see, I haven't died. And it's good. And he eats thereof. And so we have the creation, the perfection, the relationship with God, and now we have sin, and we must also deal with the consequences. In the book of James chapter 1, in trying to help make some sense out of this temptation and other things, some have said, well, the devil made me do it. Well, again, no, the devil didn't make Eve do it. The devil didn't make Adam do it. And it's not God uh, who put the tree there, who made them eat thereof. He gave them a warning. Listen to what James says in James 1, 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. 
James says, do not err. Don't make a mistake, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. What we need to do and what we need to understand in sin and its consequences is this. Eve did what she did because she did it. Adam did what Adam did because he did it. They made choices. And now those choices will have consequences. And that's, again, where we are at this point. Uh, speaking of the devil uh, and his situation, Jesus in John 8, 44, and trying to get us to understand something of our adversary, uh, speaking to those Jews who were not believing on him and and were again challenging him, he said, Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer in the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. This gives us insight unto the serpent, the devil, that was there in the garden. The devil had already rebelled against God, and we're told by Jesus that he uh, was a murderer in the beginning. He had caused a rebellion in heaven, so as we can see in the scriptures, he had caused uh, many of the angels to rebel against God. He had committed them uh, in his lies and deceit to eternal death. And what we see here is he was seeking to do the same thing in God's perfect creation. So again, the devil in the beginning, not his beginning, but in Genesis 1 and 1, in the beginning, when God created the heaven and the earth, the devil was already a fallen creature before God. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2, 11, that Satan can get an advantage of us, and so we should not be ignorant of his devices. And so beginning in Genesis 3, we see the devices of Satan, his lies, his twisting of truth, his seeking to, uh, again, deceive us and to tempt us to go against the will and the wishes of God. Paul, writing to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 6, says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that, you be a, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The word wiles there means schemes, plots. The devil is a schemer. He plots. He plans. He seeks to destroy everything that is good or could be good. And so God seeks to defend us against those schemes. Paul says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness, the devil and his angels, against spiritual wickedness in high places or 
heavenly places, the spiritual realm. It's not just that the devil was attacking part of God's creation. He had already sought to defile heaven and ultimately was cast out. Now he wants to defile God's creation here on earth. And so Paul speaks about what God has done for us, what he's given to us, and what he calls there as the whole armor of God, that we might be able to stand against these lies, schemes, plots, temptations that are brought our way. John tells us in 1 John 2, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. What a sad turn of events. In Genesis 1, we find that God looked upon his creation, and it was very good. Now John says all that's in the world, all the things of the world, the lust of the flesh, which has filled the world, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, these things are not of the Father, but they are of worldliness. They are brought to us as schemes, wiles, plots of the devil. The world is filled as a consequence of sin with wickedness. And so the world that we see now is nowhere like the world that existed in the creation. The consequences of sin. The first consequence of the woman eating the forbidden fruit was a broken relationship with God. She gave the fruit to her husband, and he did eat, and he sinned. And there was a broken relationship between him and God. And so now we have in this chart inserted something that wasn't there originally, and that's sin. Because the man, because the woman sinned, they broke their relationship with God. The prophet Isaiah, speaking about sin and the consequences of sin, in Isaiah 59, in verse 1 and 2 says, Behold, look, consider. The Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot say, neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. And so even in Isaiah's day, as our day, as starting with the man and woman, sin builds a wall of separation between us and God. And so we break that relationship. And because we break that relationship with sin, we are left, as Jesus says, in sin, the children of our father, the devil. And his lusts we will do. And so Adam and Eve... Uh, gave in to the lusts of Satan. They broke the relationship that they had with God. And while I didn't put it here, they really in, entered into a new relationship where instead of God in the top, uh, they have replaced God with the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, which is the devil. So now we have the consequence of sin itself and separation from God 
that must ultimately be dealt with or else mankind will be lost forever because of sin. Because the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6 and verse 23. John tells us in 1 John 3, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. The one main law given to the man and the woman was not to eat all the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was the law. They could choose to obey it or they could choose to disobey it. Being forced or compelled would make them robots, and God chose to give us free will, the ability to choose for ourselves whether to be numbered with the saints of God or to be numbered with the devil and his angels. Sin comes in two ways. It is an act of omission that breaks the law of God. When God tells us to specifically do something and we choose not to do it, in our stubbornness, in our rebellion, we commit the sin of omission. And Adam and Eve committed the sin of commission. They committed sin in that they went beyond the law and did what God told them not to do. And so they committed a transgression against the law not to eat. It was not a sin of omission not to eat. By keeping the law, they were not sinning. But eating of that, they committed sin and therefore were dealt with in their relationship with God. In Genesis 3, after the man and woman had sinned, we're told that the Lord came seeking to have interaction with the man and the woman. And Adam called, or and God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. When God asked the man, where art thou? Uh, God knew where he was, but the man did not. God knew where to find Adam. Adam did not realize so much of where he was at this point. He didn't realize, he didn't know what his relationship now was with God. Would God kill him the next time that they interacted? After all, God said, you shall surely die. The man did not understand his new relationship with God. And apparently neither did the woman. And so it was Adam's choice to try and hide himself from those consequences. But there is no hiding from the consequences of sin. God starts reasoning with the man saying, Who told you that you were naked? Have you ate? of the tree that I commanded thee that you should not eat. See, God is trying to teach and get the man to understand that he has listened to someone beyond himself. Some false concept has been introduced to him. Who told you that you were naked? Did you eat of the tree? Have you broken 
the law? Did you do what I told you not to? And notice, again, we, we know that the man and the woman were naked. We'll talk about that. But it's interesting the blame game that comes. Instead of Adam saying, yes, I ate of the tree that you told me not to. Notice what he says in verse 12. The man answered God and said, the woman whom thou givest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. You see how Adam tries to steer the choice away from himself and once again to hide behind the actions of others rather than his failed uh, action. First of all, he blames the woman. It, it wasn't my fault. It was the woman's fault. And besides that, you gave her to me. And so the woman you gave me, uh, he makes it sound as if she slipped the fruit into his dinner and he was unaware of it. She gave it to me and I ate. He, he makes it sound as if it, it, it was something she kind of was sneaking in. I didn't make the choice. It, you know, the woman you gave me, it's, it's her fault. It's your fault. I didn't know. Again, that. It's the way that many people respond when it comes to sin and its consequences. Notice in the chart, again, we're no longer talking about a broken relationship that between the man and God and the woman and God, but notice that when they sinned and broke God's law, sin also created a division between the man and the woman. As much as sin separates mankind from God, sin comes between man and woman, and today it comes between all of us. Our sins, other sins, break and destroy and alter our relationships from what they should be unto what sin has caused them to be. And so eating of the forbidden fruit, sinning against God, introduced sin also to one another broke that relationship that the man and woman had, the husband's trust of the woman, the woman's, again, trust of her husband and care for her husband. Notice on our left-hand side, back in Genesis 2.18, God said that he would make a help for him, someone that was meet, equal to the task. In the beginning, man and woman were equal before God, equal to the task which God had given them. Besides the consequence of a broken relationship between man and God and a broken relationship between each other, as part of the consequences of what the woman did and what the man did, God dealt with. In Genesis 3.16, in speaking to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Before there was that triangle where there was the man, the woman, and God, and the man and the woman were equal together in their relationship. They were one. What was good for one was good for both. 
there was equality. But now as part of what happens, God said that it appears that uh, conception and childbearing was intended to be much less painful uh, to the woman in the beginning. But now God said that he would greatly increase her sorrows in childbearing. And so the process of being fruitful and multiplying will now become more painful for her. And besides that, we see that God took the woman and placed her now under the leadership of her husband. And this is a relationship that still exists to this day. It existed under the patriarchal period, and it gets that name because the husband was the head of the family. He was the patriarch, not the wife. And again, coming into the uh, law of Moses, uh, that still remained the same. And in the priesthood of God, it was the sons of Aaron that ministered in the worship and service of God. The women were silent as far as ministering in the tabernacle and temple. And then again, it comes over into the New Testament also, as we will see. In Ephesians, the fifth chapter, beginning in verse 22, Paul says, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. Uh, that is God's plan. That is what God intends. It is part of the consequences from Genesis chapter 3. We hear a lot of nonsense, a lot of twisty lies put forth again by the devil in present day. The reason Paul said that's because he hated women. We hear people say that. Or that Paul wasn't married and therefore he was making laws uh, of things that didn't even concern him. No. It's from the beginning, in essence, of Genesis 3. A woman is to submit unto her husband because that's what God said. It's not because that's what Adam wanted her to do. But it's what God said Eve would do, that she would submit to her husband and in the family and in the house, he would rule over her. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. You see, the inequality now that exists, the in the beginning, man and woman were equal. After the sin, the woman was placed under the headship, the leadership of the man. And as much as Christ is the head of the church, so is man head of the woman. And as much as the, the church is subject to Christ, so are the wives to be, not to every man, but to their own husband. Of course, that doesn't mean that the husband is to torture or torment the woman. Uh, again, because God's given him the responsibility of headship in the family, he needs to take that uh, and he needs to oversee his family in love. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. In the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 2, uh, we read there of statements made by the Apostle Paul. Again, in verse 8, he says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. 
In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, modest apparel, with shamefacedness, sobriety, not with broided hair, gold, pearls, or costly array, that they adorn themselves as one submissive to their own husband. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection when it comes to the worship of the church. Paul says, I suffer not a woman to teach, nor absurd authority over the man, but to be in silence when it comes to having any leadership part in the church. And he says, Adam, uh, the reason for this, Adam was first formed, then Eve. That didn't make a big difference in the beginning, but when God made a choice of what he was going to do with the husband and the wife. Again, Eve, we're told in verse 14, uh, was deceived. She was deceived. Adam made a conscious decision. He wasn't lied to. He knew what he was doing. So God said, because the man was created first, because he wasn't deceived, the husband will be the head of the wife because he was first formed and he was not deceived. The woman is under the man because she was formed second and she was deceived by the wiles, the subtlety of the devil. And notice what Paul says when he's writing to the church in 1 Corinthians 14 about sin and its consequences and the effect that that continues to bear out in the relationship of men, women, and God. 1 Corinthians 14, 34, let your women keep silence in the churches. For it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience. And notice what it says. As also saith the law. Where does the law say that? It says it in Genesis 3. The law teaches us why that the woman was placed in submission to the husband. It teaches us why there were no women priests in the priesthood of Levi. It teaches why only the husband were the priests of the family in the patriarchal period. And it also explains to us why we do not have women preachers and teachers who absurd authority over the man because it goes all the way back to what the law tells us happened as a consequence of the sin of Eve and the sin of Adam. Now, the man did not get away from uh, his sentence. God told Adam because he had hearkened unto the voice of his wife, and eat of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. God planted a garden, and all the man had to do was tend it, to prune it, to take the food thereof, Man had an easy existence in the Garden of Eden. But it was not going to be easy anymore. You're going to have to plant your own seed. You're going to have to tend your own seed. You're going to have to nurture and care for your own seed. And not only that, but the ground will bring forth thorns and thistles the ground itself will wrestle 
with you and your work trying to overcome. He says, in the sweat of thy face, thou shalt eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken. For thou art dust, and to dust shalt thou return. The woman was given the burden in childbearing, increased pain, she was put in submission to her own husband, but Adam didn't get away with nothing. He becomes the head of the wife, and that has a great responsibility. He also becomes the source of food. He now has a greater burden because he has to prepare for himself, and he has responsibility for his wife. And even to this day, we still re refer to men as the breadwinner. And that comes from the consequences of sin and the garden. Eating life itself becomes a very tedious and burdensome task. And as we continue to look in the scriptures, we're told in Romans 8 that the sufferings of this present time, sin has brought forth much suffering, much sorrow. And we have to deal with that in this life. Verse 20 says that the creature, speaking about man and woman, as well as the whole creation, was made subject to vanity. Subject to a very tedious, tiresome, troublesome life. Subjected to the bondage of corruption. Everything we have, everything we do, is temporal. Everything we build wears out our clothes, our homes, our cars, scooters, bicycles, whatever it is, our bodies wear out. The corruption that sin brought is wearisome and greatly troublesome. He says in Romans 8, 22, the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. As sin continues to multiply and increase, to defile and to destroy, the grief, the sorrow, the suffering, it all continues, and it will continue, until Jesus comes again. Another aspect, of eating the fruit was exactly what God said. The day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. They didn't die that day, but they began that process. Adam and Eve weren't even the first to die. The first person we have recorded in the scriptures was, was their son Abel, who was murdered by his brother. And the consequence of sin is death. The graveyards, the places of burial, however, wherever that may be, continues to ever crease, increase because no one escapes the consequences of sin and death. We're told by the uh, writer, and we're going to talk a little bit about this in our next lesson, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time, <clears throat> but because of the sin and the consequences of sin, God saw in Genesis 6 the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Sin is not just a little something. Sin always grows into something far greater. 
And in, even in the days of Noah, the sin and rebellion of man had caused the earth to be defiled. And God chose to, de to destroy man whom he had created with the earth itself, with a great flood. And we're told that it repented God that he had made man to dwell on the face of the earth. We did not fare well after we were cast out of the garden. And that's a whole nother issue. As a consequence of sin, we were cast out of the garden. And God placed cherubim at entrance to the garden with a flaming sword to keep us from returning and grabbing hold of the tree of life and living forever. It's part of the consequence of sin and death. God, speaking about mankind, says, For man's imagination, the imagination of his heart, is evil from his youth. What a sad statement. From our youth even before we really appreciate or understand what sin is, little children begin to lie. Who did this? Not me. I don't know. Who spilt that? Wasn't me. I don't know. Who broke the glass? I don't know. And so from an early age, from his youth up, we learn to lie and deceive to get ourselves out of trouble and consequences. And that continues even to this day. Peter tells us in 2 Peter 3, the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. That was a consequence of Adam and Eve's sin and their uh, descendants defiling and filling the earth. The imagination of their hearts, only evil continuously. And after the descendants of Adam and Eve uh, came forth and multiplied again on the face of the earth, we have also filled the earth with sin again. And Peter says, the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved, under fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. As much as God destroyed the earth once by water, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The works that are therein shall be burned up. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. As we wrap things and begin to wrap things up today, I want you to just look at one list to understand what the consequences of sin is in the earth. Galatians 5, 19. The works of the flesh, worldliness, are manifest which are these, adultery, fornication, sexual immorality, uncleanness, various types of, of iniquity, defiling ourselves, lasciviousness, lust, temptation, idolatry, serving false gods, witchcraft, hatred, variance, division, emulation, wrath. Look at the wars, the hatred that's in the world seditions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revilings or revelings, and the such like. And the consequence of that is they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. All is not lost because Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, for since by man, that is Adam, came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. 
We indeed are thankful to God that even though we have sinned, even though we have numbered ourselves with the devil and his angels, God has given us a way back if we only choose to accept it through Jesus Christ, our Lord. On the website, the link that we have given you, there are 20 questions that go along with lesson three. I want you to complete those answers and submit them uh, to the office by Friday. And you should know the address now, Christwaybible at gmail.com. Next lesson, lesson number four, we're going to look more into the subject matter of God's repentance for creating man, the flood of Noah, and again, the effects of all of that on the earth. At this time, if you would bow with us as we bring this lesson to a close. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, once again, we come before thy throne of grace, thankful for this day, for its many opportunities for this time together. Bless our hearts, Father, that we might know and understand uh, the things of this lesson, that we might appreciate your great love, and that we might also understand the consequences of sin. We pray, Father, that you be with the sick, the afflicted, the hurting, the widows, the orphans, the war-torn areas. There's just so much suffering, Father, because of sin. We pray, Father, that you grant unto each of us a measure of your grace sufficient unto our need, and that we might look to you for strength and guidance through these troubled days and world, looking for the great appearing of Jesus Christ in that new heaven and new earth. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, and amen. In closing this evening, we wish to thank you again for spending your time in study with us. We hope the lesson has been uplifting and motivational. We encourage you to return again for our next lesson. Until then, may we invite you to visit our website. You will find many study opportunities. Our resource page has links to the Gospel Broadcasting Network, a 24-7 station with many great Christian programs and speakers. In Search of the Lord's Way, with Brother Phil Sanders. We have two links for Bibles and downloadable software. If you are looking to really expand your knowledge, perhaps you might like to try World Video Bible School, a college-level learning site free of charge. So, until next time, may God bless and keep you in His care as we walk together in His truth. And remember as always, the Churches of Christ salute you.